They were the outcasts of the Greek world. Until one man would rise and take his people to the heights of empire. Alexander was one of history's great commanders. He was well aware that he lived in an age of innovation in Greek warfare. Alexander the Great employed the latest technology to conquer civilizations, transforming the lands from Egypt to India into a new Greek world. Greeks have conquered the known world, so they're exporting their way of life because they think it's the best way of life. It's the best way that any human can live. But there are no kingdoms without a king. And with Alexander's swift and stunning demise, his empire would crumble almost as quickly as it was built. BC, a long and bloody 27-year war has come to an end. Athens, its once dominant navy destroyed, is starved into submission at the hands of its arch rivals, the Spartans. The Athenian generals commanding the main Athenian fleet made a disastrous mistake that led to a great battle and a an terrible defeat for the Athenians at a place called Agos Potamoi. In the decades after Athens' demise, the city-states of Sparta and Thebes would vie for dominance of Greece. But in 359 BC, a 23-year-old from the remote northern Greek region of Macedonia became king, and within two decades would change the face of Greece. His name was Philip II. Macedon was a, a funny Greek state. It was always a bridesmaid and never a bride. It had lots of potential, both in manpower and natural resources, but it had never managed to get its act together. The Greeks of the city-states considered the tribal Macedonians barely civilized. Yet within 20 years, Philip had unified and transformed them into the most respected and feared military machine Greece had ever seen. Philip built Macedonia on two fronts, diplomacy and strength. He began by creating alliances with the surrounding city-states, while at the same time reinventing the Macedonian army, making soldiering a full-time and highly trained occupation. But the key to his new professional army was a corps of engineers that Philip organized to design and build new instruments and machines of war an innovation that changed forever how wars would be fought and won. The Macedonians were not considered real Greeks by the Hellenic city-states. They came from a tribe called the Macedoni, and they'd been fighting barbarians for so long that they were considered barbarians themselves. However, Philip II was no barbarian. Or if he was, he was the most brilliant barbarian the world had ever seen. Hello, I'm Peter Weller. The pillar of Philip's military strategy was his combination of cavalry with infantry. And the pillar of his infantry was a formation called the Phalanx, a rectangle group of foot soldiers that traveled very lightly at a marching speed few other armies could equal. The Phalanx had been a part of Greek warfare for hundreds of years. Now Philip would infuse it with a weapon never before seen on the battlefield. The innovation that Philip did was changing the shape of the phalanx and introducing this long uh, weapon called the sarissa. So the phalanx became like a huge tank. The sarissa was a nearly 18-foot-long spear that could devastate an enemy before its soldiers could use their swords or shorter spears in a counterattack. Basically, you plant the head of your pike against the guy and push him back. Uh, and the effect is a little bit like, you know, an adult, when a kid tries to attack him and you put your hand on the kid's forehead and his little fists are swinging like this, but they can't reach you. That's what the pike uh, enables uh, Philip's infantry to do. Well-drilled, well-disciplined, and well-equipped soldiers gave the Macedonian phalanx the upper hand against traditional battle tactics. But it would be engineering technology that would ultimately make Philip's armies invincible. 
For much of their military history, the Greeks were not particularly good at siege craft. Beginning uh, around 400 BC or shortly afterwards, uh, the Greeks begin to take a quantum leap. The bow and arrow had been an instrument of warfare for thousands of years, but the bow's power was limited to an individual and the strength of his arm. One of the ancient Greeks' first innovations in military engineering was in designing a bow that harnessed more power from the entire human body than from the arms alone. The earliest weapons of siegecraft that the Greeks develop are essentially crossbows, and they're called belly shooters, gastrafetes. You had a much bigger thing that had a kind of U-shaped element at the end that you pressed against your abdomen, uh, and then you drew back the bow with both hands, pressing it with your torso at the same time, so you could create a much greater force of tension. The gastrofetes was a deadly improvement over the bow and arrow, but to truly overcome the armies of the world, Philip needed more power. In order to do even more damage, they need to come up with yet another generation of weapons. They need to invent what we might call the torsion catapult. The torsion catapult basically uh, creates springs by twisting sinews, or in some cases, horse hair, or in emergencies, even human hair. Uh, you create thick ropes of them and then twist them together. Greek engineers designed a device that acted as a belly shooter mounted on a platform. They called it the oxabelles, or bolt shooter. Instead of using the body for power, the torsion created by the oxabelles came from twisting ropes to an explosive level of tension. There's an enormous stored force because the sinews want to spring back and release that tension, but they're held. Uh, and inserted into this spring is a bar. And you then pull that bar back, increasing the already great tension. And then when the bars are released, uh, they spring back with enormous force uh, and rapidity compared to the old uh, bow flexion system. Distance no longer protected enemy soldiers from a sudden and bloody death. When fired, the oxabelles could pierce the shields and armor of an enemy nearly a quarter of a mile away, giving birth to a term that we still use today, catapult. The neat thing about the word catapult is that it means skin penetrator. You can see our word pelt, like an animal skin in the Greek catapult, goes through the skin. With his weapons of war, Philip was unstoppable against the other Greek city-states. By 338 BC, Philip's victory over Athens and Thebes made him the undisputed master of Greece. But it was Philip's actions after the battle that would indicate how the Macedonians would rule the lands they conquered, despite their barbaric reputation. Philip and his son Alexander, who's only 18 years old, defeat a coalition of Thebans and Athenians at the Battle of Coronia in 338 BC. And then Philip does a remarkable thing. He lets all the Athenians go, go back home. Then he calls together a council at Corinth, invites all of the city-states. He's got to cloak his power in some sort of diplomacy. And he tells all the city-states, you can groove. It's all going to be the same as it was before. He could have scorched the earth, just like Genghis Khan a few centuries later. But he didn't. Why? We've got to remember that the Greeks thought of the Macedonians as no better than a bunch of thugs. And the Macedonians didn't care much for the Greeks either. But Philip had had his taste of the Hellenic ideal during his time at Thebes. And as a king, he invited Greek philosophers and teachers to come to Macedonia. His entire court spoke Athenian Greek. Philip didn't want to destroy Greece. He wanted to be Greece. He was like the nerd at the back of the class who wanted to join the frat party, become one of the cool guys, albeit a little bit tougher. In his moment of triumph, led by Macedon, he was beginning, he was preparing to carry out his life's ambition, which was to invade the Persian Empire. He would never get there. Philip would meet an untimely demise at the hands of the ultimate insider. Just before Philip began his Persian conquest, he held a public celebration 
as he marched alone ahead of his entourage to prove he had no one to fear. A bodyguard suddenly rushed forward and plunged a dagger into his chest. The man who had put Greece on the map was dead at 46. Was he a lone assassin, or was there a bigger plot? We can never know for sure, because while he, the assassin was trying to escape, he was uh, mowed down by Philip's guards. Philip's dream of dominating the Persian Empire would not die with him, but only gather strength with the emergence of his son, a 20-year-old named Alexander. It was Alexander who would use Philip's army, engineers, and technology to far exceed even Philip's wildest ambitions, transforming the world into a Greek one. Marriage was a key component in Philip's diplomatic strategy. Of his seven wives, only one was a Macedonian. In just 20 years, Philip II had transformed the Macedonians into a mighty army and became the absolute master of Greece. But Philip's assassination in 336 BC cut short his ultimate ambition and self-proclaimed destiny to invade Greece's age-old enemy, Persia. Philip had conquered Greece. Now it would be up to his son to conquer the world. He was a man who became known throughout history as Alexander the Great. Alexander was one of history's great commanders. He was absolutely brilliant on the battlefield. True enough, he inherits a great military machine, but he has to get the credit for leading this machine at a very young age. Philip had laid the engineering groundwork for conquest. Now it was time for his son to finish the job. In 334 BC, Alexander led his Macedonian army of over 35,000 soldiers into battle against the Persian Empire. Persia was a massive superpower, dominating the lands of the Middle East and Asia Minor. Alexander and his army rampaged through what is now modern-day Turkey, carving deep inroads into Persian territory. But the Persians still had an advantage that Alexander had to neutralize if he hoped to conquer Greece's age-old enemy. Alexander's got a problem. He doesn't have a fleet. So what he needs to do is to find a way to neutralize the Persian fleet. And his strategy is to fight the Persian navy on land by laying siege to and taking each of the great Persian naval bases. Alexander continued to march south along the Mediterranean coast, laying siege to the cities and ports who resisted his advance. But it was the fortified and powerful city of Tyre that would provide Alexander... He was an island, a small offshore island. The city actually lay on an offshore island, and that made it relatively impregnable in the eyes of the Tyrians themselves, since they had a great fleet. All of that changed in the late fourth century. At first, Alexander tried diplomacy. He sent messengers out to the island, urging city leaders to accept a peace treaty. The answer was short and to the point. They killed Alexander's ambassadors and threw their bodies from the top of the walls into the sea. The stakes were high. If Alexander failed to take the city, it would send a message to the world he wasn't invincible. With Tyre protected from his land forces by the sea, it was up to his engineers to bring the battlefield to the city, where Alexander could fight the Tyrians face to face. Tyre would be an island no more. What if the enemy refused to come out and fight you? But Alexander realized that he could not allow his military operations to get bogged down in the face of fortifications. And that meant that he needed uh, techniques and weaponry that could attack fortifications. With mammoth walls and a fortified harbor and very little land around the walls, the city of Tyre was long thought to be impregnable. Thus, Alexander resolved to a very, very ambitious approach. He knew he couldn't take the city unless he did damage to the walls. So he had his engineers build a causeway, a bridge from the mainland to the island. 
causeway was about half mile long, 200 feet wide, 20 feet high. When the causeway was within striking distance, Alexander unleashed a hail of terror on the city, and then he deployed the only weapon he knew would end the battle, a siege tower. The towers were a kind of multi-storied armored car that moved forward on wheels. Outside, they were fireproofed with rawhide, covering the entire wooden structure. Inside, a central staircase led to a series of platforms where Oxabeles and other catapults launched missiles onto Tyre's walls. Down below, others used the tower as protection to wield a ground-level battering ram. They'd literally wheel them up to the wall. The men inside would be protected, and they would be shooting arrows at the defenders on the wall and uh, trying to cross over onto the wall and to kill the defenders. Alexander's siege towers pummeled the walls of Tyre for days. Once the fortress had been breached, Alexander went for the jugular. He unleashed a firestorm of reprisal upon the city that had resisted him. The assault itself uh, would really be a terrifying experience for everyone involved. The only way to signal would be through trumpets. So you have to imagine trumpets blaring, a tremendous noise of men uh, attacking, flags blowing in the wind uh, on the battlements uh, of the city that was under attack. I think it would have been an extraordinary scene. Alexander resumed his trek southward through Palestine. His confidence soaring, he now set his sights on the greatest empire the world had ever seen, Egypt. With its soaring pyramids and unrivaled colossal tombs, Egypt was an ancient culture Alexander revered. But there was another more practical reason Alexander coveted Egypt. It was the breadbasket of the Mediterranean, whose wheat fields would be invaluable in feeding Alexander's expanding empire. But unlike Tyre, conquering the Egyptians required no bloodshed. Alexander entered uh, Egypt as a liberator and as a figure of extraordinary uh, powers. The Egyptians not only welcomed Alexander, they made him a god. In 331 BC, they crowned Alexander Pharaoh, proclaiming him a son of Amman, their most important deity. At age 24, Alexander had transcended mortality. One can imagine that someone to whom extraordinary things happened, uh, to whom all doors seemed to open themselves magically, uh, to whom every endeavor was rewarded with victory, would think, well, perhaps I am, uh, in, in some respect, uh, a god. And I think that Alexander really did think this. He wasn't just pretending. Uh, he, he, was, he was trying to find out more about himself. By the late 4th century BC, Greek cities were springing up in the wake of Alexander's marauding army. These cities served as centers of control and administration, but more importantly, they became a means of spreading a unifying fabric of Greek language, culture, and learning. The result would be a template of city engineering that would extend to the farthest regions of Alexander's empire. Alexander ordered that his soldiers be clean-shaven so that enemies couldn't grab their beards in close combat. By 325 BC, Alexander had extended his borders almost 3,000 miles from Greece in the west to modern-day India in the east. Alexander's army may have been a wrecking machine, but the legacy his empire left in its wake was a new Greek world. Alexander's strategy for ruling conquered nations included both accommodation and assimilation. He often left soldiers behind to marry local women and act as officials in his growing empire. Towns that were formerly Persian, Egyptian, or Indian were transformed into Greek cities. It was an invasion of ideals that formed a hybrid culture that became known as Hellenism. So definitely there are striking parallels what's going on today in our today era of globalization. 
Today we have a common language, which is English, is the language of trade. After Alexander the Great, you have people who have adopted the Greek customs and the Greek language. Hellenism was built on city life, and nowhere did this expansion of Greek domination show up more so than in city planning. Whether they were beginning a new city or reshaping an old one, as the empire grew, Alexander's engineers laid it out on a grid plan that the Greeks had used since the 5th century BC. The grid plan, which was used in these cities, uh, was a symbol of order. Any government that could replace the traditional winding alleyways of a city with uh, a rectilineal grid plan of streets at right angles uh, was a government to be feared, a government uh, to take notice of. Alexander's campaigns in Asia Minor would create a new world order. Today, we call it Hellenism. If you lived in a city conquered by Alexander, you lived in a Greek city. This is an example of such a city. It's called Pergamum. 2,000 years ago, Pergamum would have had all the elements of a Greek city, agora, temples, gymnasium, theater. Pergamum would eventually rival Athens as a cultural center. As a matter of fact, the sculptural style pulled out of Pergamum would galvanize Michelangelo and change the face of the visual arts forever. Pergamum was built on a series of slopes. It was engineered like this. It was dramatic. It was theatrical. And it was meant to be. Today, the remains of Pergamum stand high above in modern-day Turkey, a spectacular monument to Greek urban engineering. The city seems to be clinging on this steep hill. It seems that the architects who built this uh, city sort of took into account the uh, topography in many ways, symbolically to start with, meaning that higher up were the palaces and the temples. The city rises about a thousand feet above sea level, which necessitated a series of complex and extensive terraces. In Hellenistic times, Athens was no longer the power center that it was before. There was a shift toward other cities of importance. In that vacuum, Pergamum rose to power. In some ways, it's an echo of the Acropolis of Athens, and where the temples stand on a hill, uh, a natural rock over the city. And no expense is spared in building splendid temples and splendid public buildings in Pergamon. And so Greek city planning begins earlier than Alexander, but it's taken to perfection in the Hellenistic period. And wherever you go, each of them has a recognizable institution. Each of them will have a Greek theater. Each of them will have Greek temples. Each of them will have a gymnasium. Each of them will have a agora, a marketplace come forum. The focal point of a Greek city could be found in its public marketplace called the agora. Here, merchants would peddle their daily wares and citizens would congregate to discuss the political issues of the day. Adjacent to the Agora was the Stoa, a simple structure that was the equivalent of an ancient indoor mall. The Stoa consisted of a colonnade on one side with a back wall on the other, a shelter providing an open space that was still protected from the elements. The Agora and the Stoas were the economic, public, and political heart of the Hellenistic city, but its cultural soul lay in another engineering marvel and was arguably the most important in Hellenistic cities, the theater. The theater is basically an Athenian invention. Drama is, above all, democratic. Uh, it develops in Athens concomitantly with the Athenian democracy. Theater was an essential and very important aspect of uh, the Greek outlook to the world, how they thought of themselves and uh, how they thought of the world. And uh, I think to, to many people's opinion is one of the great legacies that the ancient Greek civilization has bestowed upon us today. Theaters in ancient Greece were not only forums of social commentary, they inspired the Romans in their building of Colosseums and set the standard of stadium design for the next 2,000 years.
Separate your men by tribe, by clan, such that clan may bear aid to clan and tribe to tribe. Thus spake Nestor to Agamemnon in the Iliad. And those words might have been said here, because one of the great gifts of Greek culture to the world is theater and music. This is a Greek theater at Pergamum. It is the steepest of its kind. Now, a Broadway theater, and I've played in a few, holds between eight or 900 people and maybe 2,000 if it's a musical house. This theater holds thousands and thousands and thousands of spectators. So how in the heck can an actor stand on that stage and project his voice such as that the spectator in the very last row at the back of this theater can hear what he's saying? Well, the answer is sort of an engineering feat. The theater, first of all, is dug out of the side of a mountain, and it doesn't need a very big substructure because the side of the mountain provides the support for these stone benches. Second of all, the theater is in a semicircle, and the semicircle gives way to an amazing sense of acoustics. You can stand on that stage, and you can almost whisper, and someone in the very back row would hear you as if you were speaking right into his ear because the sound would bounce off the back wall. Third thing is, is that the actors wore masks. And these masks not only function as character, but they also function as sort of a megaphone through the lips. So these three elements combined, this theater would be a fantastic place to come and hear the Agamemnon performed by Aeschylus. I think undoubtedly the best preserved ancient Greek theater, uh, the theater at Epidauros, and the Argolid Peninsula and the Peloponnesus. Greek theaters were divided into three basic parts, the theatron, or viewing area, in which the audience sat, the orchestra, or dancing area, in which most of the action took place, and the skene, a timber building set behind the orchestra. The skene and its flat roof were used for dressing rooms, as a backdrop, and sometimes for staging scenes. The theater at Epidaurus has 55 rows of seats and is divided into three horizontal seating sections. Stairs divide the sections of seats into separate wedges. In all, this giant theater has an estimated seating capacity of 12 to 14,000 people. But it's the acoustical engineering that makes the theater at Epidaurus clearly spectacular. If you're sitting up in the top row, you're a long way away from the stage. Uh, and the person who's down in the orchestra or on the stage looks quite tiny. And yet, you can have a conversation with that person with only a slight elevation of your voice. In just 10 years, Alexander had set the stage for Greek culture to dominate the world. But empires and their leaders eventually fall. Alexander was no exception. His untimely end would give rise to kings and kingdoms whose engineering feats would be considered ancient wonders of the world. In 326 BC, Alexander founded the city of Bucephala in honor of his slain horse. By 323 BC, Alexander had forged an empire that spread from Greece in the west down through Egypt and to India in the east. His conquests hinged on his army's use of advanced technology, but they also depended on Alexander's legendary ability to command the loyalty of thousands of men. But after 13 years and thousands of miles of constant warfare, that loyalty was stretched to the breaking point. His troops, their loyalty finally was used up. They rebelled against him, they refused to go further, and he had to turn around. While returning from India, Alexander was preparing to consolidate his empire when he was struck by a mysterious illness. No one knows exactly what it was that killed him, whether it was an infection, whether it was the result of uh, a very hard life as a soldier in which he was wounded in battle, of these extraordinary travels in which he, according to legend, subjected himself to the same hardships as his soldiers. One of the stories is that, that he essentially drank himself to death. There was always intrigue at the Macedonian court. Alexander's father had been assassinated. Or is it possible that he was poisoned in some way? Those are questions we can't answer. On June 10, 323 BC, just one month shy of 33 years old, 
the most powerful man on earth was dead. Now the stunning rise of his sudden empire would be matched by its spectacular and bloody fragmentation. A power struggle between the regional commanders quickly ensued to fill the void left by Alexander's death. These generals and their heirs carved out vibrant Hellenistic kingdoms and for generations fought a continual battle for dominance. The land of Egypt would fall to Alexander's general Ptolemy, who had been left to oversee the wealthy territory on the Nile. Ptolemy would shape a kingdom that combined Greek and Egyptian culture into a dynasty that would last for almost 300 years. Uh, Ptolemy I was a man who had made a career as a uh, military commander and advisor under Alexander. What he therefore wanted was as rich and secure a portion of that empire as he could get. Egypt was the crown jewel of the Mediterranean. Its surplus of grain meant that a windfall awaited Ptolemy as ruler of the breadbasket of the ancient world. Ptolemy's plan was to ensure his legitimacy both as Egypt's king and also true heir to Alexander. Macedonian tradition held that the one who buried the body of the king secured his rights to the throne. So Ptolemy hijacked the funeral procession of Alexander and brought the mummified body to Egypt, where it would eventually rest in Alexandria, the same city Alexander himself had founded 15 years earlier. Under Ptolemy, Egypt would grow to be a powerful kingdom, and Alexandria would transform itself into the intellectual and scientific capital of the Greek world. He wanted it to be a city that uh, joined with Greek culture and used both Greek and Egyptian technological know-how uh, to build a new Athens, if you will. Alexandria lies on Egypt's coastline, and an easily accessible harbor would be vital for sustaining trade with other cities around the Mediterranean. To that end, Ptolemy ordered one of the most ambitious engineering projects ever seen, the world's first known lighthouse. During the night, it's shown uh, to a great distance, and ships can actually see it from many, many miles away. And during the day, there was smoke coming out of it, so it was still very visible. It must have been a formidable thing to behold. At the time, only the Great Pyramid at Giza was taller than the lighthouse. Legend says it stood 300 feet tall, comparable in size to the Statue of Liberty. Some estimates claim the lighthouse may have stood as tall as 450 feet. How the lighthouse was built remains a mystery, but 25 miles from Alexandria, a funeral monument stands that researchers believe is a scaled-down replica of the actual lighthouse. Based on that model, it appears the lighthouse was constructed with three separate and distinct levels. The lower level was square, the one above was octagonal, and the final one was cylindrical. And on top, there was the beacon. From the top of the lighthouse, a strong and steady beam of light emanated out into the sea. Scholars believe wood was most likely the lighthouse's fuel, and that the lower section housed a spiral ramp large enough for pack animals to climb, pulling carts laden with firewood. The ramps may have led to a series of storage rooms where the firewood was kept. From the second level upwards, a shaft with a dumbwaiter was probably used to lift fuel up to the top. There are uh, stories about uh, mirrors and devices that could uh, amplify uh, the light of this uh, fire so that it could be seen from uh, miles and miles away. But uh, there is no real evidence of such a thing. And there are quite a few scholars who believe that it was just a normal beacon, it was just a big fire uh, and uh, nothing more. The lighthouse stood for almost 1,600 years, battered by storms, tidal waves, and even earthquakes. Then around 1300 AD, massive quakes brought that ancient wonder of the world crashing down for good. For nearly 700 years, the lighthouse lay buried underneath the waters of the Mediterranean. 
Then, in 1994, a team of divers and archaeologists uncovered massive stones in Alexandria's harbor, revealing what may be the foundations of a guiding light in engineering history. Jean-Yves Emperor, a well-known French uh, archaeologist, started a very, very important series of uh, underwater research. He is finding um, members, architectural members, of the uh, pharaohs. So there might come a day when it may even be uh, restored. Beneath the waves, archaeologists documented pieces of stone that weighed more than 70 tons including one piece that was believed to be the lentil of the lighthouse's massive doorway. But the lighthouse would not be Ptolemy's only engineering marvel in Alexandria. As the lighthouse rose above the skyline, he launched another building project, one that brought the greatest minds in the world to his cosmopolitan city. It was called the Great Library of Alexandria, a place that claimed to have over 200,000 scrolls dedicated to knowledge and learning. It was here that one engineer would harness the power of steam 1,700 years before the world ever imagined a locomotive. It was in Alexandria during the reign of Ptolemy II that the Hebrew Bible was first translated into Greek. After the death of Alexander and breakup of his empire, one of his generals who had formerly lived his life conquering civilizations now wanted to create one. Ptolemy's infusion of Greek culture into Egypt's wealth and prestige would lay the foundations for a new kind of city, one that would become the greatest and most cosmopolitan in the ancient world, Alexandria. It's the city of the world. And as such, the kings, the Ptolemaean kings of uh, the new kingdom of Egypt, created something that's completely new in the known world. It would be the towering fires of Alexandria's lighthouse that guided ships into the harbor. But it was another vision of Ptolemy's that became a beacon for the greatest minds in the world, Alexandria's museum and library. But that does not mean it was for exhibiting something. A museum at that time meant something like a research center. It's a think tank, perhaps the world's first great think tank. And Ptolemy buys great scholars and writers from uh, around the Greek world. And the library is the greatest repository of books uh, in the Greek world. It had a mythical amount of scrolls, something, some say 200,000, some say 700,000. It was at the museum and library where for the first time in human history, knowledge becomes a commodity to be stored and shared. In fact, some scientific discoveries made in Alexandria over 200 years before Christ wouldn't be accepted until 1800 years later. Pupils were taught the Earth was round, and one of the great astronomers, Eratosthenes, calculated the circumference of the Earth and was off by less than 1%. So it's perhaps a very interesting story that the Ptolemaean kings, uh, whenever a ship will come into Alexandria, uh, the first thing that uh, the captain had to do is had to declare if he had any papyri, any uh, works of philosophers or science on board. They were taken to the library to be copied, but usually they gave the captain back a copy and not the original. Although Ptolemy was a Macedonian Greek, the key to the success of his dynasty in Egypt would be in its willingness to assimilate Egyptian culture. Ptolemy's own family went to great lengths to adopt Egyptian practices as their own. Ptolemy's son, Ptolemy II, even married his own sister, Arsinoe. There had been a tradition in the Egyptian pharaonic families of brother-sister marriage because, and there was a sense that a figure like that couldn't just marry any old ordinary mortal and that eventually only a sister who sort of shared his divine origins was an appropriate companion and spouse. 
The Ptolemies may have used Egyptian traditions to elevate themselves to the status of gods, but in the end, like all pharaohs before them, these kings were still mortal. Ptolemy wouldn't live to see all of his dreams of Alexandria fully realized. He died in 283 BC of natural causes before the library and even the lighthouse were finally completed. Alexandria continued to flourish as a mecca for knowledge under its Ptolemaic rulers and produced many of the age's foremost thinkers. And it would be just after the end of their nearly 300 year reign in the first century AD that Alexandria would produce one of the most famous Greek engineers in history. His name was Hero, and his famous designs place him among the ancient world's greatest mechanical engineers. All his books are extremely detailed, very well describing all engineering procedures. But Hero himself also was good in the sense that he has a, an inclination in favor of arts. We must remember that in, uh, in ancient Greek, the word art was meaning also technology. Hero's engineering designs had many practical uses, including ideas for fire extinguishers, odometers, and even automatic doors. But it was Hero's experiments with steam technology that would ignite his imagination. The first working steam engine was built in England around 1700 AD. Over 1600 years earlier, Hero built the forerunner of the steam engine, called an Eola pile. It was a, a metal a sphere put up in such a way so that it could uh, rotate freely and had two tubes applied when filled with water and heated from below, steam developed and uh, started to turn to put the sphere into motion, thereby turning air into something very useful, something that you could control. We maintain that under other historical circumstances, this industrial revolution could possibly have taken place in Alexandria after a couple of centuries. The essence was there. The interesting thing about the steam engine of Hero is that the guy discovered steam power. Okay, so the question beckons, how comes they didn't use steam power? How comes they didn't make uh, steam engines like uh, the English did? a few centuries later. And uh, the answer to that is that in Egypt, forced labor or slave labor was so cheap. You didn't need machines to do the job. So that's like an interesting idea. You can have a technology and you don't know what to do with it because there's not a real economical need for it. Hero's inventions still intrigue engineers to this day, but there might have been many more innovations from Alexandria we may never know. Scholars don't agree on when it happened, but much of the ancient world's scientific knowledge vanished into smoke and ashes when the ancient library burned to the ground. Still, Alexandria and Greek engineering were flames of innovation that lit the ancient world like a star that guides a ship across the sea. The miraculous age of Alexander may have seen empires rise and fall, but what's left in its wake is a legacy still felt in our own world today. To outsmart the raw forces of nature and to turn them into something beneficial. That's the common denominator for all Greek engineering. Alexandria was no doubt the pinnacle of Greek mathematics and engineering with its fantastic library that sadly went up in flames, and the tomb of a man who not only conquered the world, but showered it with Hellenism. The passing of ideas and ideals, the culture and values of Greece. But even as Alexander's empire crumbled, Greece was not to be extinguished, no. It was absorbed by what many believe was the greatest experiment in Hellenism of all, Rome. I'm Peter Weller for the History Channel.